Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 35th Breakfast at Sustainability. My name is Stefania Xivia, and I am a Governance and Social Innovation Officer at ICLEI, the leading global network of towns, regions, and cities committed to a sustainable future. Since 2009, ICLEI has been organizing this series of dialogues called Breakfast at Sustainability at our office in Brussels inviting uh, regional representatives and politicians from the national and the local level, as well as EU officers to discuss pertinent issues related to sustainable development. This time we are meeting in the context of the Ruritage project, a Horizon 2020 uh, project that turns rural areas into laboratories to demonstrate cultural and natural heritage as a driver of regeneration. We will look at uh, smart specialization strategies today um, who are being developed at regional level in view of the next programming periods. And we will explore how local cultural assets can become drivers of place-based socioeconomic transformation agendas. And although we may not be able to taste the Belgian waffles for breakfast or meet in person in Brussels, we do hope that uh, with this digital edition, we will expand the outreach of the Breakfast of Sustainability um, series in um, rural and in urban areas that can most benefit of the information and the knowledge being shared today by our esteemed speakers. Today, um, we have around our digital breakfast table two experts on smart specialization strategies, Mr. Laurent de Merfet from DG Regio and Alessandro Reynolzi from the European Commission Joint Research Center. We also have experts on cultural heritage, cultural policy um, and heritage preservation, um, such as uh, Mr. Hoffman from uh, DG EAC, Professor Luigi Fusco Girard, and Simona Tondelli from the University of Bologna. Last but not least, we are welcoming two representatives of the European regions, including Mr. Bueno Benito from the region of Castilla y León in Spain and Gabriela Macoveu from the Northeast region of Romania. At this point, I would also like to thank and express uh, my warm gratitude to the ICLEI team supporting this event, including my co-moderator, Alexandru Matei, as well as Cristina Garcillo and Anna Isulain, who are supporting us backstage. Our event today will be divided into two rounds of discussion. Following a brief introduction to the topic and the context of today's um, event, we will focus on the state of play regarding RIS3 and cultural and natural heritage. At 10.50, we aim to have a 10 minute break to go offline, stretch our legs, get some fresh air and refocus. At 11 sharp, we will start, uh, we will meet again here for our second round of discussion, which will focus on lessons learned and future directions for a better placement of heritage within the second generation of RIS3. We will aim to keep some time for burning questions before the closure of the event at noon. Keep in mind that today's agenda and the flow of discussion has been designed based on the questions submitted during the registration process. We may not be able to cover all of your really to the point questions, but we will do our best to uh, meet your expectations. Actually, if we have a look at the participants' input uh, during the registration process, we can see that the majority has little or moderate familiarity with smart specialization strategies. Apart from our esteemed Ruritage partners, we have many cultural actors in our audience uh, seeking to get informed and get involved in the process at regional level. We also have um, regional representatives currently working on RIS3 and looking to better ad advise their authorities or integrate heritage to their work. We have students and researchers working on regional development and heritage preservation, but also policymakers looking for innovative examples and best practices. Curiosity, seeking inspiration and new ideas, deepening knowledge, 
Finding new collaborations and expanding horizons are some of the key motivations that bring us here today. So here are some technical tips to make most of this event. Please choose the speaker view on the top of your screen so that you can focus your attention on the person talking each time. Please keep your camera and microphone off at all times, so avoid interrupting the discussion by accident. Use the chat on the bottom to, to share thoughts, to introduce yourselves, uh, ask questions or share relevant links. Keep in mind that the event is being recorded and will be made public on the Ruritage website in due course. Also, look out for our graphic recording of the event, which will be done by visuality and which you will be able to see on one of the speakers' windows uh, immediately. Try not to multitask, but do have breakfast. At the end of the day, it is a breakfast at sustainability. And don't be alarmed if you see a, a yellow or a red card appearing on your screen. These are just notes for our speakers to be mindful of the time. Last but not least, if you want to share your thoughts on social media, you can find the Ruritage channels on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And using the suggested hashtags, you can find and locate uh, relevant information and other people's insights. And now uh, it's time to pass the mic to Simona Tondelli, full professor at the Department of Architecture at the University of Bologna and coordinator of the Ruritage project. Thank you, Stefania, and welcome every, everyone to this event. My role here is uh, uh, to present very briefly our project, uh, which is about rural regeneration through systemic heritage-led strategies. So we all know that uh, rural areas suffer from economic, social, environmental problems. So we expect uh, uh, unemployment, depopulation, loss of cultural landscape diversity. But on the other hand, rural areas are, are rich in cultural and natural heritage. Ruritage project aims at promoting rural regeneration by making cultural and natural heritage the driver of a sustainable growth. That means to create economic growth, new jobs, revenues, but also to work on social inclusion to improve accessibility, to improve quality of life, and to work on the quality of landscape and environmental balance. This is our paradigm. To make a rural regeneration possible, Ruritage establishes an innovative heritage-led paradigm based on the identification of six systemic innovation areas, pilgrimage, local food production, migration, art and festival, resilience and landscape, whose intersection constitute a European model of heritage-led rural development. Among the partners, Ruritage has identified 13 role models, that is to say territories that have successfully achieved rural regeneration. Seven additional role models have been selected through an open call in autumn 2018. Ruritage classified, described, analyzed the role models, practices, business models, governance frameworks, and the regeneration mechanisms to better understand how they might inspire more uh, rural areas. This resulted in 97 role model actions and 40 lessons learned. Six other rural areas are engaged in the project as replicators. All of them have worked intensively during the first two years of the project to learn from the role models successful strategies through a multi-level and multi-directional knowledge exchange. Universities, research centers, SMEs act in the project as key facilitating partners allowing the knowledge exchange and providing tools and methodologies for supporting the role models and the replicators. Ruritage innovative paradigm relies in the establishment of a multi-stakeholder approach. Each role model and replicator has established a rural heritage hub, which is both a physical space 
and the community of local stakeholders, representative of pol le policy levels, uh, research institutions, uh, SMEs, uh, industries, and of course, uh, citizens. That learning from the role models uh, co-develop and co-implement uh, their own path to rural regeneration. The result of this process is described into the six replicators regeneration plans, defining regeneration strategies to build upon digital, tangible and intangible heritage, adopting an holistic approach that promotes cross-cutting actions among the six systemic innovation areas. Ruritage has developed a set of tools to facilitate the upscaling and further replication of the regeneration processes in even more rural communities. 18 additional replicators selected by an open call are in the process of starting their own regeneration plans. While the role models are working to further enhance their sustainable growth, the tools are open but to be used by any rural community interested in promoting their sustainable growth through the enhancement of their local cultural and natural heritage. From our activities at local level, we have gathered some lessons learned. The success of the regeneration process relies on the one hand in the capability to engage key stakeholders with leadership and influence capacity. And on the other hand, the empowerment of citizens, establishing and supporting bottom-up initiatives. By ensuring continuous communication about, among the key stakeholders, by engaging public and private bodies to establish private and public partnerships, and by involving the local communities, including vulnerable groups, it is possible to share and implement a long-term vision for the regeneration and sustainability of rural areas. At policy level, we aim at boosting the exploitation of cultural and natural heritage as a driver for rural regeneration worldwide with a white paper that will be delivered at the end of the project. We have already taken into account the challenges posed by uh, the COVID pandemic to rural areas and we have delivered a vision paper about how to turn the COVID-19 into an opportunity for rural communities. Now, today, our aim is to start to tackle regional smart specialization strategies for promoting the inclusion of cultural and natural heritage among the national and regional priorities in order to build a competitive advantage in rural areas. And now I leave the floor to uh, Alex, uh, um, which will present uh, a bit of more tips and uh, keywords about uh, smart specialization strategy and uh, RISA3. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simona. Just allow me to share my screen here with you uh, and we will start to, uh, we will continue this process. Please confirm that you see my screen. Is it okay? Uh, is my screen yeah. visible? Yes, Alex, perfect. We can Excellent. see. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I'm very honored to be here with you, uh, with all of you. I see a lot of interest. Um, please allow me to bring a, dish, a bit of additional information uh, that are key for our discussion today. Um, and with that said, uh, as Stefania indicated, this answers a lot of the questions already posted in um, your registration. So first thing first, why this event and why now? Well, it's simple. We are researching the topic for some time and we have observed that um, they, there is, oh, sorry. There is a very uh, uh, a good network uh, and group of actors on different institutions working on risk-free smart specialization. And then you also have a lot of uh, good networks on cultural heritage. Um, the relation between the two of them tend to be very much in the same typology of um, uh, group. What we want to do today is to offer an opportunity to bring these two together closer and to um, uh, make more synergy between the two topics, because I think there's a lot of value there. Uh, the second point, why now? It's very simple. We are going 
think in the new programming period 2020 to 2027 and with that said it's now the moment where the details of this topic are defined on RIS3 uh, the new regulation the new aspects and now is the moment to talk with them or give feedback on what happens in order to have an equal understanding of the terminology I will just go on the main concepts today and share with you the key uh, vocabulary and concepts I will start with smart specialization I will explain how the entrepreneurial discovery process is fitting inside the concept and how everything of this is included in the research and innovation strategies for Mars specialization. Going further, of course, we will question where exactly culture, natural heritage is located and also innovation and how they are related with the system. Smart specialization is defined since 2009 based on the Knowledge for Growth Working Group, which was coordinated mainly by Professor Dominic Foray. Uh, they explain that smart specialization is a place-based approach characterized by the identification of strategic areas of innovation. And it's based on one, on one hand on the analysis of the strength and potential for the economy, and on the other on the entrepreneurial discovery process with a wide stakeholder involvement. Furthermore, smart specializations are outward looking processes that embrace a broad view of innovation, including but not limited to technological driven approaches, and it is supported by effective monitoring mechanisms. Well, I will also explain how this, uh, uh, this concept emerged. So what it was observed is that you have institutions that need to manage budgets for research and innovation. They receive many ideas, domains, and requests for funding for many organizations. The classical or the most, yeah, in the past, it was very common that this budget is distributed relatively uniform. And as a result, the consequences was that not much impact was achieved with little budgets. Smart specialization is basing an alternative to this approach in which you are asked to very carefully select the domains you are fin financing, but give them a bit more uh, power, so more funding in order to make it work. And this is what we, uh, it's trying to do. The entrepreneurial discovery process is a learning process, of course, to discover the research and innovation domains in which a region has and hopes to be uh, at um, uh, upper level, to excel. It has two elements very important. On one hand, you have the entrepreneurial actors that need and most probably will take a leading role in discovering the promising areas of future specialization. And on the other hand, the policymaker will need to make a step back and realize their role will be a bit more modest in, so to say, select the right areas of specialization as it was before. Research and innovation strategies for smart specializations, they are an integrated place-based economic transformation agenda. They can be made a national or regional level. We already have guidance very clear on how you do methodology and content since 2012. More or less the same period, we also have a platform dedicated for a year for it on which you, which is providing advice for European countries and regions for designing and implementation of such uh, strategies. In the platform, you also have uh, tools where you can filter, for example, uh, with keywords, different topics to see who is working on what. Um, it is true to say that some researchers indicate that this filtering is debatable because culture is almost never uh, emerging in the, uh, in the tool. In terms of policy aims, very shortly I will mention this is related with the cohesion policy, uh, which is trying to maximize the impact of European funding through thematic concentration. Um, we had the first generation of risk free in the cohesion policy 2040 2022 related with the Europe 20 uh, strategy. And now we're going to the second generation. We look on the cohesion policy 2021 to 2027 in relation with European Green Deal. Very shortly, important is to mention that in the first generation, we had an ex ante conditionality related with it. That meant very simplified that if you had no risk free, then you had uh, no, you were receiving no money. And on the other hand, um, now we are talking about an 
enabling condition. And what I understand uh, is that this is related with good governance of national regions, smart specialization strategies and multi level governance. And I will invite our speaker to relate to this in a minute. There are some fulfillment criteria related with the enabling condition. I will not get in them. There are seven. Um, I will also extend a bit on the fact that very recently we observed the fact that we have the culture and creative regional ecosystems uh, uh, emerge. This is a thematic area under the platform, but also a group of regions working on culture and creative industries in relation with new technologies. And they aim to stimulate new insights and opportunities on this topic. Culture and natural heritage, it is presented here, uh, but it's not very clear how uh, will be related. It's very young. Um, towards to culture and natural heritage, Simona already very well presented, so I'm not going into all the details. We talk about very complex uh, concept with many values from um, tangible to intangible culture aspects. We have the fundament, which is natural element. We talk about them in integration and more and more now we also include digital elements in this integration. Uh, and again, as she said, um, Commission is also putting a focus here. We have um, researcher and uh, working on the uh, topic. Uh, last year, for example, University of Uppsala published some paper. This year, we have, have our colleagues from the Rock Project with um, the TASO group dealing on this topic. Uh, their paper is more on urban. Um, our area will focus more on rural. Going further with innovation, just two words, and then we go into discussion. What we can see, and this is confirmed by everybody in the research and practice, innovation will uh, is and will remain most important factor for economic development. What is important to realize is that innovation is very broad. You can have technological uh, innovation products, service innovation, but also can have more uh, business model processes and organizational innovation. And very recently, we also talk about social and environmental innovation, which is also one subject of the commission. With that said, I put two words about what social innovation is. So it's new ideas that meet social need, create social relationship and form new collaboration. And with that said, I want to conclude my part by emphasizing, uh, giving you a conundrum. Very often we, we try to implement innovation, but we face this reality. Yes to innovation, but no to change. With that said, I will want to uh, continue our discussion, start our discussion actually, uh, and invite um, Mr. Demessi to open his video camera. Um, I will gradually give him space to, uh, to talk. And I want to um, say, so uh, Mr. Demesse, you work at the unit of smart and sustainable growth of the uh, DG Regio of the European Commission and serve as a French national expert on urban regional policy. So what is the state of play regarding risk free for the new programming period? And what has changed since the previous 2040-2020 program? Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me and see me? Yeah. All good, thank you. Okay, so thank you, Alexandru, for this uh, excellent introduction on uh, the um, uh, smart specialization strategies. Um, so please, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, so uh, after your introduction, I, I will not need to elaborate too much too much on on uh, the concept of smart specialization uh, strategies. But uh, I want to stress uh, that uh, uh, it was a it, it's a powerful tool which was introduced, as you said, for the current programming period as an excellent conditionality. So uh, maybe it was uh, seen at the beginning as uh, it could have been seen as a an administrative constraint for the member states and regions in order to, to receive ERDF funding for uh, research and innovation investments. But uh, it's a, it's a, we can say it's, a, it's successful, uh, successful in, 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 uh, uh, because it uh, allowed, in, it enabled the stakeholders to uh, define uh, priorities and, and to concentrate their resources on, on priorities. So um, we, you have on this slide you, the amounts um, 
from ERDF, which went to uh, research and innovation projects, thanks to smart specialization strategies. Um, 40 billion and, uh, euro and uh, 65 with co-financing. Uh, around 180 smart specialization strategies supported by the S3 platform, which, which is managed by the, the Joint Research Center, but maybe my colleague uh, Alessandro Rilandi from the GRC will say a few words on it. So it's a, it's a place-based approach, as, as uh, Alessandro said, uh, and there, so it's really based on the identification of, uh, of strengths and potential of the economy. And uh, it's a bottom-up process with uh, involving stakeholders and it's a, uh, it's a dynamic process. The uh, smart specialization strategies are not, uh, well, they, they, it's a, they are living uh, uh, processes, they are uh, updated. And uh, concerning the cultural and creative industry sector, uh, the, um, we, we can see that uh, uh, around 185 uh, priorities were um, uh, established in uh, uh, around 124 regions. Uh, it's uh, the uh, S3, plat S3 platform tool which can, which can show, show this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then, for the future, uh, the um, uh, well, as Alexander said, uh, cohesion policy. Uh, sorry, the smart specialization strategy will become an enab enabling condition for the uh, for ERDF. Um, more precisely, it's the good governance of smart specialization strategies, uh, which will um, uh, enable the. Um, uh, member states and regions to receive uh, ARDF funding on under cohesion policy objective one, which is a smarter Europe. The future cohesion policy will have five policy objectives, and the, the, so the first one, a smarter Europe, will benefit from a thema uh, thematic concentration. Um, to give some figures, it, it's uh, an estimation. Uh, out of a total envelope for ERDF of 200, 200 billion euros for this uh, new period, uh, there will be around 80 billion euros for policy objective one, which is on innovation. And smart specialization strategies um, will be, uh, well, they, so they will uh, play a greater role. And also the, their scope will be broadened. Traditionally, smart specialization strategies were limited to uh, research and innovation capacities, but now the scope will be extended to um, so uh, four specific ob objectives, we, which you can see. So the first one is on research, innovation, and also uptake of diverse technologies. You have the second one on digitization, the third one of support to SMEs, and last but not least, the fourth one, which on developing skills, specialized skills for um, um, okay, so uh, smart specialization, smart specialization strategies will have to cover these uh, four um, uh, four items. So, um, well, and, and finally, what I what can I say? Um, yeah, uh, the uh, um, smart specialization strategies will uh, also uh, need to bring stronger links with uh, horizon uh, other programs. Uh, uh, Horizon Europe, Digital Europe, and the Single Market Program. Uh, that's all for my side, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Demercy. Um, with that said, I think uh, I can stop the sharing of the screen at this moment and gradually invite um, uh, our next um, uh, speaker. So I want to introduce for you uh, and ask to explain his views also, uh, Mr. Rainoldi. So Mr. Rainoldi, you are the head of unit on uh, for territorial development at the Joint Research Center Seville of the European Commission. The GRC has been supporting the implementation of smart specialization strategies and basically uh, developed the SP3 formal for some time. Should region update their RIS3 and why? And in extension, what role can nature, uh, culture, and natural heritage play in this process? 
Thank you, uh, Alex, and uh, uh, very pleased to, to be here and to share my, my thoughts with, uh, with all the, the participants to this, uh, uh, to this event. Alex, we share a very beautiful name. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, and, uh, and quite, an, quite an intriguing question, actually. Uh, you put the question, I, I try to, to give some uh, uh, some points to, 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 to answer to, to that. Should regions update their, their smart specialization strategies? Well, it's for the regions first to, 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 to respond to this question. Um, we, if, if regions think that they have, uh, that their current smart specialization strategies is the best pick, is their best pick to face the challenges, challenges of the next uh, seven years or so and uh, uh, effectively use uh, the cohesion funding uh, for, um, for economic transformation of their territory, that's uh, probably fine. But uh, um, I think that uh, uh, before saying that they should modify their strategy, I think they indeed should think of whether they should modify their strategy. And, uh, and that's because of uh, probably two main uh, main general issues and, uh, and and one specific. The two general issues are COVID, one. Uh, I mean, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, abstract from uh, from the pandemics. Uh, and I think that uh, um, mass specialization is indeed a tool uh, in order to uh, shape uh, a recovery process. Uh, which is uh, based on the uh, advantages and the strengths of each own territories. But not only that, it's based also on the uh, capacities and ambitions of local communities. Uh, in both oral, uh, urban and, and rural landscapes. Uh, uh, I think that this is a very, very powerful tool in order to put together the knowledge that exists uh, in terms of uh, science, uh, uh, patenting, uh, markets, uh, innovation, research in one territory, but also the knowledge which is inside the communities and the, 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 the values, in fact, the, 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 the ambitions that they, that they have. The second general point um, is about uh, uh, it's very similar. It's about global challenges. When the smart specialization process was uh, started, uh, we were in 2014. So we were one year ahead of uh, Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, and seven years ahead of the Green Deal. Uh, uh, this means that the, the, the general uh, uh, directionality of the uh, policy effort at the very global and top level has changed and the issue of sustainability uh, has uh, uh, has been incorporated very strongly in both the European uh, agenda and the uh, and the global one and uh, of course you can you can try to see whether smart specialization strategies of the 2014 2020 period already incorporated uh, uh, or had some influence on uh, how to achieve SDGs at the local level, for example, or how to uh, put together uh, or how to link to Green Deal priorities. But one thing is to do it uh, exposed. And one thing is for regions and local communities to put their, their own global challenges and how they wish to tackle their, the global challenges in their ter ter territories upfront in the uh, in their smart specialization strategies, which uh, Laurent has, has just mentioned, they are profoundly changed in a way that it's not just about research and innovation. It's really about a, a, a genuine transformation agenda for, uh, for the territory. And indeed for, for rural uh, uh, areas, this is, uh, this is most, uh, uh, most important and also most, uh, uh, most challenging. And I think that uh, cultural and, and natural heritage have a, have a role to play as they, they, they did, maybe not uh, overwhelmingly in the, in, the, in the previous round of Osmar specialization, uh, but indeed they, uh, they can be seen as a way to promote innovation towards sustainability I would say everywhere, probably not only in, in rural uh, areas, but probably rural areas have a, have an interest in there, because 
they can uh, really try to build systems uh, of innovation around uh, around elements of uh, of natural and cultural uh, and cultural heritage uh, and just one uh, maybe 30 seconds more if you if you allow me alex it's uh, it's just to say that uh, uh, you, you mentioned very well uh, that uh, what we do in the, the GRC, the S3 platform. I don't need to add uh, to add anything. I'm very pleased that that, that you did. And probably will use your slide if you if you <laughs> if you allow me in my future presentations. Uh, but uh, I would like to say uh, current uh, uh, S3 priorities regarding cultural and natural heritage are not just about tourism, which probably is the most obvious uh, element that you associate to that. But it's also about technologies. It's also about uh, uh, not only digital uh, technologies, it's also about materials. Uh, it's also about uh, a built environment. And it's also about uh, immaterial priorities, such as uh, uh, we have uh, probably around uh, if, I, if I'm not wrong, 15 regions that mention, for example, culinary traditions and local food systems. And this is, uh, uh, this is my last point. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we, have an, we have an opportunity to think outside the box with this new programming period. And uh, whether the final outcome is modified or not modified as mass specialization strategies in one region, I think we, we indeed have to very uh, think very carefully about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reinoldi. And I'm, I'm already uh, excited to see so many connections with also what Simona was saying about the rural projects and initiative um, she is working on. Um, we will return to this and connect also with Mr. De Messe, uh information before, but now allow me to also introduce uh, in our discussion uh, Mr. Hoffman. So Mr. Hoffman, uh, you are policy officer for culture at the DG for Education, Sport, Youth and Culture of the European Commission when focusing on culture and creative sector. Uh, so how can culture and natural heritage be a driver for innovation in smart specialization strategy. Um, and please connect with also what speakers said before, please. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for the introduction. I hope you can hear me and see me well. Yeah, all okay. well, please. Okay, perfect, perfect. So I'm very happy to, to join you at this uh, at this breakfast occasion to, to also present a bit uh, the perspective from the Commission from uh, DG Education and Cultures. Of course, our our let's say perspective is slightly different because we work uh, we work on the European Union's culture policy and we work very much with the principle of mainstreaming. This is something that is included in the uh, Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, Article 167, which actually says that the Union has to take cultural aspects into account uh, in its action under different provisions of the treaties. So in a way that, uh, uh, on the one hand, of course, we have to uh, recognize the intrinsic value of culture and cultural heritage for, for, for what it is, but we have to think about culture also in this broader sense. When we, we think about economic growth, when we think about social cohesion and inclusion, when we think about uh, the role that culture can play for, for well-being. And I wanted to kind of stress out here that all of this is actually underlined in key strategic documents for the European Union on culture. So this is New European Agenda for Culture of the Commission and the European Framework for Action on Cultural Heritage of the European Commission, but also the Work Plan for Culture 2019-2022. And this is a document established uh, and put in place and negotiated by uh, EU member states culture ministries. All of these three documents actually recognize this uh, intrinsic value of culture and cultural heritage, but also the role that it can play in the broader sense. When it comes to new European agenda for culture specifically, there is also a very interesting uh, uh, fragment there, which says that, that cities and regions are actually natural partners for experimentation, because of course they are on the forefront of uh, uh, cultural and local development. Uh, they are attractive and they actually in a way attract the attention of high talent individuals. So this also of course includes very much broadly understood creative classes and they are very close to the, the needs and potential of their inhabitants. So this is also the, um, the kind of you know, special role that cities and regions can have in Europe. And uh, 
uh, when we look at cultural and natural heritage broadly, of course, we can um, we can also like think about it in quite broad sense. We just had an example about uh, culinary traditions, actually, which which can be part of of smart specializations and this edge. And this is a very important point that actually culture and cultural heritage are very very well placed in a way to to give this distinctive edge and give this competitive. Uh, advantage to cities and regions because they're of course very very diverse and they're based on on this cultural diversity that we see across the european union and this is also very much in line with uh, with this way of thinking we had in place in 2018 during the european year of cultural heritage which was of course a very successful year of celebrating europe's diversity and culture but it was also a year of, of, of broader reflection on how cultural heritage can be uh, a resource a resource we inherit from the past but with, which we can use for the future for a better economic and better social future. Uh, so I think the key actually to, um, to having cultural heritage um, um, and the natural heritage included in smart specialization strategies is really the strategic thinking, uh, thinking across silos, thinking across departments and policies. Um, there is also one, one kind of last example I would like to give here coming from, from what we do in DG education and culture that links to it, uh, which is maybe also quite known by you, European Capitals of Culture. This is a EU initiative uh, that has been in place since 35 years. And of course, many of you might think about it as a year of Again, celebrating culture and and the cities coming to to have this title to celebrate their diversity to have culture events. Uh, but what's important here is that the preparation for for for, for European capitals of culture each time starts six years uh, ahead of the of the year when the, the specific city is given the title. So this is a very very uh, thorough and detailed selection process that happens. The cities have to submit their uh, proposal for consideration, um, and it's. Uh, uh, four years before they are given the title, they are formally designed as the European Capital of Culture, and this is also something uh, that is quite interesting because it's, it's it actually links to this idea of uh, transformation agenda for the territory, and it also very well shows how culture can play uh, important role in these local uh, lo local strategies. And and if you look at the example of European Capitals of Culture, of course you can see um, cities that were more or less successful in doing so, but of course the most successful cities that took this opportunity and 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 and, uh, and 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 where this you know held this title for a year actually had managed to come up with a legacy so something that goes beyond uh, this one year of celebration so this 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 is this is again something that has to be taken into consideration thinking about culture and cultural heritage as a strategic resource um and and having this vision this this uh, global vision and vision going beyond uh, specific uh, activities you put in place Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hoffman, and indeed very inspiring. Uh, and I, I recall uh, a lot of the uh, cultural capital that I also had the opportunity to visit as a transformation process beyond the name and that specific year. Uh, excellent. Um, I will welcome now in our discussion uh, another expert on the culture scene and transformation. So, um, Fus uh, Professor Luigi Fusco Girard, I hope you have a good connection now. Uh, if you have the possibility, open your uh, 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 camera. Uh, in between, so Professor, professor Fusco Girard, uh, you are Associate Professor at uh, IRIS, Institute for Research and innovation and services for development in Italy. And you have exper uh, extensive experience in developing research and innovative projects on the adaptive use and cultural heritage. Um, how smart specialization of uh, heritage can be integrated with culture strategies? Because you guide, can you guide us in this? Yes, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Oh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, to you all. My presentation is about this uh, point. Uh, I would like to stress this idea, this message. Smart specialization of the rural heritage in particular should be interpreted in the perspective of the circular economy model for becoming uh, really uh, able to integrate with cultural strategies. Smart means, in my opinion, first of all, circular. Why? Because I want to stress that the circular economic model is not only an innovation in the relation to the current economic approach. It is not only the integration of economy into ecology. 
It is not only a kind of green economy, no. It is also this, but it offers a culture of cooperation, a culture of uh, uh, collaboration, a culture of uh, um, integration, a culture of uh, integrating, uh, promoting uh, synergies. And we need very much in this period of extraordinary change, this kind of culture to reduce the conflicts that are growing, the many conflicts between uh, human uh, being and natural ecosystem, between rich and poor, pe poor person and so on. And we need to a more fair redistribution of the well produced. So uh, my first uh, slide is about this uh, period of accelerated change in which conflicts are growing, in which disequilibria are growing, and the COVID is an example of the consequences of this equilibria. And uh, with the smart uh, innovative strategies, in my opinion, is the capacity to reuse the cultural uh, natural assets in the perspective of the circular economy model uh, as an entry point for implementation of the circular economic model in the space. Stimulating not only innovation in technologies, but also in values, in culture, for orienting towards a more toward human-centered strategy. The next, please. The circular economic model is an innovation inspired of the wisdom of nature. So it requires specific innovation technologies. Uh, it, it requires a new knowledge to enhance innovation and the capacity itself to become adaptive. The adaptive reuse of the heritage in this perspective is the reuse able to transform a dead, in general, site into a living system to be managed as a living organism as an organism is able to continuous adaptation to the changing dynamic contents through the capacity to reorganize, to repair, to self-regulate, and therefore able to become more and more resilient. Specific innovative techn technologies are required in this perspective. Uh, if we assume, as I am assuming, the lens of the bioecology. The next, please. This diagram can show some example of required new uh, no, uh, technologies, an example of innovations in technology for closing the different loops in the logic of this adaptive circular reuse. Uh, you can see in the, la in the side of this uh, diagram, the city and, the, and on the other side, the countryside and all the relationship that requires specific technology. The question is this, we have all these technologies, no, we have some of them, but other we have to identify through a strong, strong research capacity. The next, please. This, uh, this, uh, this diagram is the diagram that is the message of the CLIC uh, research project. This diagram means uh, the conditions for the success. I define this the tripod model. It is a triangular model. For the success, we need, first of all, to become able to organize a system, a self-sustainable, a self-organizing, a self topoietic system. Why? Because if this system is really autopoietic, it is by itself able to sustain other components, other than itself. This means that it is able to generate a flow of impacts, positive impacts for other components. Some of these uh, impacts are spread in the territory and some of them can come back to the system itself. The triangle is, uh, com uh, is, uh, com is uh, com combined by regeneration principle, generation capacity, and the symbiotic capacity. The next one, please. In the rural area, 
I think that a good example of agroecological symbiosis could be uh, offered by this image. It is an image that is uh, realized in Finland, in Palopuro region, in Palopuro, yes, region. The secret is to become able to organize an ecosystem, a self-sustainable autopoietic system that become able to become generative and thus um, able to contribute to local economy, to local and regional economy. Some outcomes of this agroecological symbiosis are, for example, the economic outcomes, less costs for energy. Next one, please. Next one. Next uh, one. Yes, uh, less cost for energy, less cost for fertilization, uh, for sale, uh, for the plus production. Other impacts are social as new jobs, uh, a close relationship between producers and cons consumers, it's environmental impacts uh, because the new metabolism is able to valorize the quality of the landscape. Uh, and so on. But uh, I want to stress this idea that uh, the more important uh, impacts of this model are cultural impacts. Because uh, uh, this model, if we understand really in depth, uh, offer us uh, a new horizon, a new cultural horizon. First of all, a horizon of long terms. Second, on uh, an horizon linked to the capacity to cooperate. Cooperation is the integration, synergies is the key element of this model. This means the capacity to, to see in the uh, relational perspective. This uh, circular model is a relational model economy. So, it offers a new culture, a new way of thinking, a new mindset, much more rich than the economic conventional one. It offers a relational perspective. And I want to conclude in this way, the, next, the, the last one, please, the next one. We need today to regenerate not only our heritage or natural assets, we need, first of all, to regenerate, or in the same time, our current culture in a more solidaristic perspective. This is more important because uh, we should become able to interpret our rights culture, not in an individualistic perspective, but in a relational, relational perspective. This help us yeah. to, to go on this growing fragmentation and atomization of the society. So I will conclude that we should reshape the new Green Deal strategy into this cultural dimension that is a human dimension linked to the local community. I thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fusco Girard, and indeed a very complex overview of uh, um, what we have in practice. And I like the fact that I've seen uh, Mr. Hoffman talking about uh, silos, and you also emphasize synergy, and you also brought us back to the values uh, of what we should do in the European Union. We will come back to this, but please allow me also to, um, to introduce now uh, and go to the local where everything needs to be implemented those people that have all the pressure on their shoulders and the regional level to do the job so i will introduce for you uh mr uh buenito uh bueno bon benito um gumercindo so mr uh, bueno benito you have served the santa maria alear foundation for historical heritage for over a decade and have recently been appointed General Director of Cultural Heritage at the uh, region of Castilla y Leon in Spain. Uh, you, um, so I, I will invite you to, to reflect on how has your region integrated culture and natural heritage into RISFRI and what were the domains you selected 
that um, um, are the pro uh, projected uh, and what is the projected impact so far? Okay, thank you, Alessandro. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this interesting breakfast. Uh, yes, um, the, the, the process to include the, our uh, cultural and heritage sector in this risk three it was complex. Uh, after a regional context of potential of different sectors analysis, they defined that natural and cultural heritage, also with tourism and Spanish language, could be an economic specialization pattern. So it is clear that we have some potentials here in Castilla León, and we, we they, they focus the people were they, they were working on this. Uh, strategy they focus on this potential so uh, after consider that uh, cultural natural heritage could be a, an economic specialization pattern that it's very important for our sector uh, they they reflect on the how they connect with the scientific specialization and, and technological specialization so uh, it was shown that it could be a driver for this uh, scientific and technological specialization. So after this um, process of analysis, they, they consider that these endogenous resources could be a, a thematic priority. They can transform in a, thema a thematic priority for the risk three. And now this thematic priority is natural heritage, cultural heritage, and Spanish language. And think that it's very important to be included in these four, this, there are four priority, uh, uh, thematic priorities. And one is agriculture. The second is the product, uh, productive sector. You know that here in Castilla León, we have a, a car uh, manufacturing sector, very important, and uh, also, uh, another very important uh, thematic priority is the, the, the social care, the health and demographic challenge. So to be included in these four, one of these four thematic priorities is so important for our sector. And the fields in, that were chosen to, to work on it they were competitiveness and innovation for the companies. It's important to make a stronger the cultural heritage and natural heritage sector. The companies that, that can uh, work here in, in, uh, for a long term and also they can uh, work in, in different countries. So the second uh, area was excellence in science and technolog technological leadership. You know that this connection with these fields from our sector is very important. And of course, our sector can be a field for research and it is clear. And the other for where internationalization in order to make possible to, for companies and the whole sector uh, to collaborate with uh, others in Europe. And cooperation that is similar, but from the internal point of view, with uh, the, the stakeholders here in, in Castilla León and the digital agenda to provide ICT solutions for the cultural sector. The impact of uh, this risk three in this moment is to increase the number of research and innovation projects. It's, it is clear that uh, we have uh, found a, an important uh, increase of the number of research activities. Um, Another impact is related with the progressive use of technology in all the uh, steps, in all the phases of the value chain of the management of the cultural uh, heritage. And another uh, impacts are related with the training and improvement of the skills on the professionals here or the companies and the, the uh, public sector also on the international cooperation. I think these are the four main impacts related with the race three in, in our cultural heritage. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Buenito, uh, bueno Benito. Um, I think that's also uh, a good of
of you. And I must say, I'm very impressed that uh, something that I was not thinking of, such as the language and the yeah. e intangible heritage was selected in this process at your uh, stage, which is quite special. And it's also one of the reasons we consider it very valuable to be um, here and talk with you. Um, I will gradually uh, go to also introduce our next um, expert. So, uh, Ms. Gabriela Macoveu, I invite you to open your uh, camera. I, I hope connection goes well. And uh, Ms. Macoveu, you are Director of the Communication, Innovation and External Cooperation Department uh, at the Northeast Regional Development Agency in Romania and have extensive experience in designing and also implementing and communicating regional development projects. Um, the two regions, I will make a small comment, uh, Castilla León and uh, North East Romania, some have some, have some common features in terms of similar population uh, opportunities and challenges, um, but they are also in different uh, geographical context. And Mr. Makoveu, I have uh, learned that um, the Northeast region uh, did not include culture heritage strongly in the first edition of the RIS-3, um, but now um, situation is changed. So what role plays culture and natural heritage in RIS-3? Why have you decided to prioritize cultural and natural heritage for the next programming period? Thank you very much for inviting me today to participate in this conference. To be short, uh, I think that there are two reasons. First reason is related to the fact that we have became more mature in terms that we have uh, capacitated the ecosystem of the stakeholders to be able to focus on a, on a vision, on a, sec let's say, a specific strategy that can be applied to create the advantages, uh, the competitive advantages that they were mentioned by uh, uh, the president the speakers. Um, actually, in our first smart specialization strategy, the sector of tourism has been mapped from the perspective of the rich potential of patrimonium and um, uh, the number of um, museums and uh, pub public collections, archaeological sites, uh, UNESCO monasteries, you name, natural parks. Um, the statistical figures show that we are looking very, very well from the perspective of the potential. Then we were looking to the competencies. And we saw that out of seven public universities in the region, six, six universities have specialities that are touching the needs for addressing the development of uh, the uh, cultural and historical patrimony and the exploitation of the, of the um, uh, natural uh, sites and um, the agro-food uh, diversity. But, uh, then we have to put this in this on the same page with the with the discussion how you can bring the innovation between the stakeholders that are connecting with these aspects that are uh, linked with uh, ecotourism, agrotourism, uh, uh, for example, or marketing uh, services, and with the innovation and research. And I think that at the moment of 2013, when we have discussed for the first time, it was too soon, too soon to see that there is this distinction between development projects such as, or innovative projects such as. And I think uh, we had to recognize that we start the road without involving uh, the priority of tourism in our smart specialization strategy. Although during the implementation, we've noticed uh, that um, tourism, uh, cultural and natural patrimony is related very well, like I said, with other three sectors named already, which is technology of information of communication, biotechnology and agro-food. Um, what happened? Now is that when we are doing the revision and we are looking into the lessons learned, we see that meanwhile, there is much stronger ecosystem. Let's give you some example. 
there are there is a new cluster structure that has been created with a strong vision that the region must be uh, more attractive and promoted with including innovative solutions there is also uh, the Im implication of um, the ecotourism destination that has been certified in the region. We have two ecotourist destination out of uh, six in the country. One is the Buffalo, the Buffalo um, uh, land uh, that is unique in the country and where the researchers are coming with very innovative ideas to use uh, renewable energy and to re to use um, electric mobility and uh, sensors for traceability to to um, have these beautiful animals in the, their natural landscape uh, visited by tourists. Another one is the well-known Bukovina, made in Bukovina land, became also an ecotourist destination, but there we had a research center working in a mountain area uh, that has um, coming now with um, projects related not only to the traceability of um, mountain uh, product, certified ecological products, let me say, but also they are looking to, to have a more responsible research-oriented projects uh, uh, related to to this. So in short, uh, what we have now is we have three niches of specialization for tourists. One is related to tourists for healthy living, and this has everything to do with our uh, balneary um, uh, resorts with the accessibility, with nutrition and climatotherapy, because we also have um, uh, spark uh, natural springs and uh, others uh, it's like salines that can be uh, exploited. Second is the ecotourism. Ecotourism is also linked here with the many services that are already offered for adventure tourism, for relax, for gastronomy, for uh, agrotourism and yes Romania has a tradition of having total circular farms and we still have these kind of farms preserved and we want to make them more valorized and uh, the last but not least is the cultural um, uh, tourism that has to be promoted. What the stakeholders request, and here I'm coming to the second issue, why? Because we became managing authority for the ROP 2021-2027. It is a unique opportunity when we can bring on the same page what is the strategy for using the funds in the ROP, but not only in, uh, in the good correlation with the national uh, sectorial operational pro program for uh, smart growth and digitalization, and also with uh, uh, the mm -hmm. national plan for uh, rural development, because uh, we are looking to in two direction. One is to support innovation uh, in, uh, project, innovative projects implemented, and people request for more investments in SMEs to innovate, cluster support, um, uh, research, uh, cooperation between research and industry and internationalization. We have already implemented 55 projects uh, for uh, valorizing the cultural and natural patrimonium, both in urban and rural area. Our plan for the next programming period is to use two instruments that are very good. One is the local action groups that uh, allows us to, to make use of the ecosystem of the um, uh, strategy for a local mm -hmm. action group and to valorize the patrimonium. And second is to uh, use the integrated urban development instrument. For rural development, I think it's very relevant to have into account these local action groups because now for the first time we can see that they understand that even where do you do not have SMEs such as, for example, you have cooperations and handicrafts, it's still uh, potential to um, incentivize them in uh, developing um, um, 
their capacity to become more um, more visible and to offer new services. And I think that's that's in all the the reason why. So more mature and new opportunities that we want to to take into account. Uh, Based on lessons yeah. learned and the experience accumulated. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Makoveu. Um, indeed, very interesting. And I, I've seen when you talk about these farms and the connection with the Buffalo um, Reservation, I already reflected also what uh, Professor Luigi Fusco Girard was saying previously about this agro food system with all the complexity. And you also made very clear distinction with the local action group and the uh, 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 Integrated Urban Development Initiative for Urban and Rural. With that said, I think um, I will give gradually the space to our uh, colleague, Simona Tondelli. She had very carefully listened to the discussion and um, she, she can intervene with some reflections on that. Please, Simona. Thank you, Alex, and I really would like to thank all the speakers because uh, this was a very, very interesting session already, uh, and uh, they gave us a lot of uh, suggestions uh, to, to think about. Uh, first of all, I would like to start uh, from the similarities that uh, we can detach uh, uh, among what we are doing in a Ruritage project and uh, this process of uh, entrepreneurial discovery and uh, this bottom-up approach that has been described by every, every speaker today. Um, we have territories in our project that are in the position to be able to influence their uh, risk tree strategy. Uh, they can uh, um, really uh, set the scene for uh, the, the vision of the rural areas that they belong to, but this is not uh, our only goal. So we start from, uh, of course, working at the local level within our partners, but our ambition is higher. So we are here today discussing with you because we would like to upscale this approach. So we would like really to um, give some uh, examples, some good practices of uh, how we can make a cultural and natural heritage a driver through this uh, multi-stakeholder approach that we are uh, really developing. Uh, a second point, so uh, two keywords that were discussed in different presentation were this bottom-up approach, which is uh, um, belonging to both processes and also the place-based, which is fundamental. So what we are really trying to to do with our project is to um, um, make the people think, uh, also starting from examples of what have been done uh, in other uh, contexts, but really think on their local opportunities. So to tailor processes, to tailor strategies, and to make them uh, their own processes, their own strategies, so really place-based processes. Um, and uh, I also would like to spend uh, a couple of words on uh, this uh, um, issue of innovation. I, I think that uh, many of the speakers underlined how uh, we shouldn't speak only about uh, technologies, but this uh, Alex was saying uh, something about social innovation that is really at the core of our work, mm -hmm. but which is so uh, rich uh, in uh, rural areas. So social innovation is really one of the main features I think we can exploit <laughs> and reach in, in rural areas. And this uh, uh, process of enabling the stakeholders in defining the priorities has a very uh, different results. One is of course the feasibility because if they are committed, uh, the process then can have results, can be implemented. Uh, but there is also a sense of belonging. So the idea of uh, valorizing what you have locally, so your cultural and natural heritage. So we have this double approach. Other uh, keywords that were mentioned, uh, uh, dynamic process, adaptive, circular, all those words uh, work together. Uh, and uh, again, I agree very much with this perspective of uh, being able to adapt uh, uh, we, we speak in our project also of resilience, no? So it's uh, about uh, how to use uh, local resources, cultural, natural heritage to shape uh, a, a vision for the future, but also to be able to adapt and to change uh, this vision according to the different opportunities or, ch or challenges. Uh, so um, we were speaking about the COVID, for example, uh, which has really uh, 
had, had a, a disruptive effect because no one was expecting such a, a pandemic. So we have to uh, start to think differently to really put in place new and different strategies and the building on the local values can be a key to interpret this new perspective. Uh, I invite you also to have a look to the vision paper we have on our uh, website we have uh, published because it's made of practices of real examples of what can be done to overturn the challenge of the COVID in rural areas. Um, and then uh, again, there is this need to put together science and knowledge of the local community. Also, our last speaker, um, Mrs. Macovieio, was starting from the uh, point of the university's uh, knowledge, so what they could offer to the territories. But I, I think that the, it's very important to see how this knowledge, how science can be matched with the knowledge of the local community. So to keep together these two different aspects. And the idea to be dynamic, to adapt to the global challenges also is very important because we, we have to, to find a way uh, to work locally for these global uh, challenges and these global objectives. Um, I also would like to spend a, a word on the value of culture. Mr. Hoffman was mentioning uh, some very important points here uh, about the intrinsic value of culture. Of course, we have to, to keep in mind the intrinsic value of culture, but we also have this role that culture can have for sustainable growth of the territories for social inclusion and sustainability. And uh, I take the chance for uh, mentioning one question that was uh, made in the chat about uh, the capital of culture. Um, uh, this is a point that we also have discussed in our project. So the fact that there are a lot of initiatives at the EU level that seems to be a bit too focused on cities according to our perspective. But in, in the case of the European capital of culture, and I will invite uh, Mr. Hoffman to address this a bit later in the second round of discussion. Uh, perhaps we have some examples of also of uh, networking with among different small cities and their surrounding countryside. So this could be something that can be implemented. Um, I, I am going to stop here just focusing on another key word, a key concept, let's say, which is the human centered approach, which is really at the core of what we are discussing and uh, what we should be our main aim. I'm going to, to thank stop you. Here. Thank you very much, Simona. And that's a good uh, connection that you see during the process. We will come back to this uh, relation in the second part. Um, and with that said, uh, I will just give the space to my colleague uh, Stefania. She has a bit of uh, information and then we see what happens. So hello everyone. I hope you are not too overwhelmed by this uh, first round of discussion. I think it has been a very good uh, overview of the technocratic, the policy aspects, the human, the natural aspects uh, of 33. Um, as many of you have noticed, we have reached the limit of uh, 100 participants, which is really amazing and unexpected. And uh, we will try during the break to enable either a Facebook Live or to make this space a bit bigger because many people are trying to enter. Uh, keep in mind that the event is recorded, so there will be a chance also to follow uh, after we finish the actual uh, discussion. And uh, maybe you have noticed already, but there is a participant called Maria Fulquier, uh, who is uh, designing our discussion. And you can see her live in her little window, especially if you pin the video. And during the break, we will also be able to see uh, in a bigger format her wonderful uh, piece of work, highlighting the key concepts and providing also some nice cartoons of uh, our speakers. So um, we will take a break now uh, until 11 uh, o'clock and we will start exactly at 11 o'clock. So please be back in case Zoom kicks you out. Please use the same link to re-enter. Um, and we will uh, also, you can also use this time to uh, put your questions down in the chat so that in the second round we can have a, a more uh, Q&A, let's say question um, Q&A session with our, with our speakers. So it is uh, now 
10.50 almost. Take 10 minutes, have a coffee. I am ready here with mine. So please have a coffee uh, and see you back in 10 minutes exactly. Thank you very much. Excellent. So remain with us, we're coming back.
So here we are back at the 35th Breakfast of Sustainability, uh, discussing the importance of cultural and natural heritage in regional smart specialization strategies. We're ready to kick off our second round of discussion with our esteemed uh, panel of speakers. So I will ask all of them to reappear. Please turn on your videos. Um, and uh, we will go for a second round with um, a bit more focus on the practicalities, some examples, some lessons learned, and some future directions uh, on how to better include cultural and natural heritage into the, these three, as we call them. So I will uh, start again with Mr. Laurent de Merset. Uh, thanking you also um, on behalf uh, of our team for being here today. Um, we have discussed uh, the initial, let's say, positioning of these three focusing on innovation, technology, and we have noticed that cultural and natural heritage kind of remains marginal uh, to this history process in many regions still. So how do you think we can improve that? And what can cultural actors do uh, in order to contribute to this process in the region and bring uh, cultural natural heritage to the mainstream? Okay, so thank, thank, th thank you. Um, uh, so um, first of all, I, I would like to maybe to give a more positive message uh, as, uh, <laughs> as you did, you said that uh, the involvement of cultural actors in uh, S3 process is marginal, but well, uh, a, a lot of work has already been done. We, we gave uh, figures on the numbers of regions uh, uh, in, involved in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in culture, I mean, which the number of regions which put uh, uh, cultural uh, items in, in, in their stra strategies. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's progressing and uh, uh, in fact, uh, the cultural sector is uh, is really in a strategic position to to promote uh, uh, smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth in all EU regions and cities. And the this sector is fully contributing to the EU's growth strategy. Um, so, investments in the area of culture uh, can have a positive impact on the economy, uh, social change, human development in terms of innovation, growth, and jobs provided that these investments are grounded in development strategies with a sound economic rationale. Um, so the, the, the culture is, plays already an important role in many sectors of the economy and topics covered by the structural funds. Um, some EU regions have been very good at uh, tapping into this extraordinary potential as a way to promote social economic development including through the use of uh, cohesion policy funds like ERDF. But however, um, some other regions have not been making much out of its potential. So there is indeed a margin of, of, of progression. So what can the actors do? Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, yeah, I would, would like to stress the fact that ERDF will continue in the future to play particular attention to using culture to design and implement targeted implementation strategies focused on the delivery of job and growth in Europe. And what can the actors do to develop such strategies uh, which use culture? Uh, so the actors uh, should pay particular attention to uh, map mapping regional assets. So identify uh, the, the the stakeholders and, and the potential they should take for this, they should take into account the level of development of, of culture activities in the region concerned. Uh, may I remind you that uh, the development of smart, smart, specialization, smart specialization strategy, it's a, it's a dynamic process, but it's, it's also a bottom-up process which involves all the uh, actors from the, uh, I would say, the, the credible headaches of the uh, public authorities but also uh, research, uh, industry, and, and civil society. Uh, the, so all, all these actors should be uh, uh, involved in the decision-making process uh, using an, in, uh, an inclusive approach. And this, uh, this really is, uh, is, is the job of, nation, of national or regional authorities to, to, to make uh, sure that the, uh, these, the actors are involved. And also, uh, the 
uh, actors uh, could use uh, um, approaches to, 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 to investments and, and to use of financial resources. Uh, they, uh, they could try to find synergies uh, in the use of the cohesion policy funds, the, the RDF, but also uh, synergy with uh, the Creative Europe Framework Program, the uh, uh, COSTMED program, which uh, supports uh, SMEs, uh, Horizon, the Horizon 2020, and soon Horizon Europe, uh, which is a framework program for research on even innovation. Uh, so there are indeed pl plenty of uh, opportunities for uh, uh, funding uh, uh, innovative projects in, in, in culture. And so the actors should be uh, uh, aware of this, uh, these opportunities and uh, it will help them to, 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 to take part in a smart specialization strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. De Merset. Uh, you stress the importance of mapping and really understanding what what we have. We very often focus on what needs to be done and forget what is already there. So I think this idea of really mapping the assets of a region uh, lies at the very core of uh, developing a, a smart, a really smart specialization strategy. And um, we, we heard uh, about the entrepreneurial discovery process uh, as let's say the, the, the guidelines uh, coming from DG region in this, uh, in this um, respect. So I would turn to Mr. Alessandro Reynosi and ask um, how does this uh, entrepreneurial discovery process uh, facilitate multi-level governance? Since we have uh, seen also from previous um, uh, contributions of speakers that it's not only about the region kind of creating a document, but really engage uh, in this multi-level approach with the local, but also the national and maybe also the international level. So um, can you tell us a bit more about this entrepreneurial discovery process, how it works and how some of our participants could get engaged? Thank you. Um... It's, it's not easy to uh, try to explain in detail uh, the entrepreneurial discovery process in, uh, in, in a few words. But I think that uh, um, Alexandro did it in the, in the first uh, uh, part of this, uh, of this meeting, in, in this event, in the sense that uh, it is about the putting, uh, I would say, pooling resources and uh, capacities and knowledge together. Uh, it, is, uh, it is basically empowering uh, stakeholders uh, empowering a different territorial level in order to uh, combine uh, the, um, the vision that uh, a regional authority uh, has on, on the future of its, uh, of its territory uh, with uh, what comes uh, uh, bottom up, with what the, the, the communities and the stakeholders and the actors that of, of innovation in that, uh, in that particular region uh, think and uh, uh, together uh, identify as the most promising potential for, uh, for, for development. Uh, so this, is, uh, this means that uh, in terms of mechanism, there are a variety of mechanisms that can be put together, can be facilitated by, by regional government, by regional development agencies. Uh, I mean, I have, uh, I see Gabriela in the, in the picture and uh, she, knows, she knows very well, we have worked uh, very closely with, with her on, on the northeast of, uh, of Romania. And indeed, uh, one of the challenges, uh, not only there, uh, but also in, in regions that are much more uh, accustomed uh, uh, and traditionally um, devoted to, to innovation is, is really to, to, to understand that anyone uh, can have a say in, uh, in that uh, in that respect. Uh, you, uh, you, you uh, specifically asked me about multi-level governance. Well, indeed, uh, there is an ideal situation and there is the, the reality and, and uh, often these two don't, uh, uh, don't really match. But uh, I think that it's, uh, it's a learning, learning by doing process. And I would uh, uh, strongly push uh, uh, local communities, uh, uh, urban communities, rural communities to, uh, to engage into a, into a smart specialization uh, debate in their own territory, in their own constituency, 
and uh, uh, because I think that this this is a way to be more influential at the uh, at the regional level and uh, uh, show that uh, uh, you have made your homework and therefore it's not uh, it's not all uh, it's not all, everything is not a burden of the regional level but actually you have made uh, something for uh, for them uh, we have worked uh, specifically I, I make one example with the uh, with a, a rural community in Extremadura in, in Spain, which is close to where I where where the mass specialization platform is established in, in Seville, and, and they have uh, put forward their own vision of mass specialization strategy based on uh, based on uh, based on food, basically based on uh, a denomination of origin, uh, a cheese, a special uh, type of cheese. And it was not only about tourism, uh, uh, but it was about tourism. It was about culture, indeed. It was a, uh, about also some kind of uh, innovative ways of, of putting tourism inside the, the smart specialization strategy. And they managed to, to, to actually uh, made this uh, a topic of uh, the regional discussion about, uh, about smart specialization. So I think this is a, a kind of a driving by example is a, is a very good uh, point. And the second point, uh, you mentioned international uh, partnerships. Well, indeed, uh, it's not only a question about uh, uh, cities and rural areas uh, being listened to by the regions where they belong, uh, and then the regions by the country, at, uh, uh, but also uh, a question of um, intercepting and pulling together uh, and putting together priorities that uh, uh, are similar uh, beyond the borders or across uh, across the border because that is also a multi-level governance process that might not be specifically targeted to your uh, to your individual region or country but it's pretty much targeted to the to the european level and uh, uh, and this is uh, very uh, and we, we we have seen the the powerful interactions that uh, these uh, partnerships uh, uh, that the, I think that the uh, the cultural and creative regional ecosystem partnership was was mentioned. It's a new one, but there are uh, partnerships which are more established, and they are and they have consolidated a dialogue not only at uh, at the regional level. Uh, but also at uh, European level uh, with uh, uh, Horizon uh, partners, with uh, DigiGrow, uh, with the partners that can mobilize uh, also funds that are not specifically cohesion, uh, cohesion funding, but, but are of European, uh, uh, of European interest. Um, so uh, I, I know very well that, uh, uh, you know, to conclude, uh, that uh, uh, it's not uh, it's not easy to to talk about multi-level governance, and very often uh, uh, you talk about uh, your wishes uh, and you talk and you don't talk about the reality. But in order to not to keep it as just wishful thinking, uh, I I really do believe that uh, uh, again the the examples. So uh, trying to understand what is your own smart specialization. Uh, can uh, can be uh, a way forward to make your case uh, at the at the regional and also uh, at the at the national level, um, and I think uh, uh, I I would stop here. So okay, you, thank you, Mr. Reinaldi. I, I'm really happy actually that you mentioned the example of Extremadura. We may not have a representative with us here today, but it is an example that really, um, I think, pictures the essence of smart specialization. So you did mention the, the, the cheese. I think it's La Tarta del Casar or something. So it's a special cheese produced in Extremadura. And not only uh, did it lead to connect to the cultural heritage and tourism, but as Mr. Uh, as Professor Fusco Girard mentioned, it is connecting to preserving the ecosystem around the production of the cheese. So pr uh, protecting the sheep and uh, investing um, regional development funds to create a shepherding school. So that is, I think, a very good example on how building on a local asset, we're bringing in capacity building, infrastructure, but also um, an ecosystem restoration approach in order to keep 
uh, economic development and growth in the region. Um, so moving to uh, Mr. Uh, Hoffman now, um, I mean, we, we saw some examples uh, about um, the innovation trends in the cultural and natural heritage. Uh, I was wondering if you could share with us a few more examples from your, from your experience uh, on how regions are using uh, different cultural and natural assets uh, to boost innovation, uh, as discussed, uh, innovation understood in a broader sense, but at the end of the day, still contributing to economic and social um, development. Of course, I'm, I'm very happy to do this. And uh, I think the easiest way for me to do that would be to, to relate to, to some specific projects we have uh, organized as, as the European Commission and uh, which were financed by the Creative Europe program. In fact, uh, the projects which really focused on peer learning and exchange of uh, good practices and, and of mutual learning between local authorities. Uh, I will send afterwards in the chat like the links to the to these projects so you don't have to worry and and, and uh, yeah, so, yeah, I will share this with you. But uh, but the, the first project of sorts I wanted to, 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 to tell you about is Culture for Cities and Regions, which is a peer learning project for, for local authorities and local stakeholders, which we run between 2015 and 2017. Um, it was again financed by Creative Europe program and uh, led by EuroCities uh, in collaboration with ERIN, European Regions Research and Innovation Network and CAI European uh, Affairs Consultancy. And as part of the project, uh, we identified more than 70 case studies, uh, which happened also together with, with 15 study visits and uh, 10 learning sessions that were organized for, for, for cities and regions. So the idea here was that, that we really give space to to, to, to local and regional authorities to share, uh, to share, of course, the best practices and things that work, but also to share the challenges that they have. So, so I allowed myself to just, you know, before this uh, meeting today, to have a bit of a look back at this work we've done and the, and the catalog and some of the study visits we had. So um, what I would say is key in, uh, in looking at how, how you know, culture and, and heritage can be included in innovative local practices is first of all, uh, finding ways to, to manage cultural resources together and this is, for instance, an example of uh, one of the cases we had in the catalog and one of the visits we had in the, the town of Aquileia in the Friuli Venezia Giulia region, which actually has uh, tourism and culture included in its original smart specialization strategy. Uh, the idea here was to look at how uh, how to best use this uh, archaeological park in, in, in Aquileia, but also how to make sure that local population is uh, is involved in, um, in, in, in preserving cultural heritage. So this is, of course, very important to, to keep this in mind, that we have to involve local populations uh, in a way to be, to be innovative. Uh, another point, uh, since culture is everywhere, and we already mentioned this uh, idea of of breaking the silos. It's also very important to make sure that different departments uh, of local and, and regional authorities can work together. And we can also find examples of, of, of such work in uh, uh, in this case, for instance, in, in, in Finnish cities of Espo and Helsinki, where cultural and education departments work really hand in hand to, uh, to deliver cultural education and, and also come up with interesting activities uh, for cultural institutions and stakeholders. Uh, another point uh, on openness and flexibility. It is very important for, for, for local leaders, for local authorities to have a certain vision, long-term vision, but also show certain flexibility. And here I would like to, to refer to um, your European Capitals of Culture, because Simona also mentioned it, and then I saw in the chat there was a discussion about uh, European Capitals of Culture too, and how it plays with, uh, with let's say, non-urban setting. Um, the city of Aarhus in, in Denmark, which was the European Capital of Culture 2017, is an interesting case here, because uh, part of their program was also to work very closely with non-urban areas and really to involve the whole of central Denmark region in uh, in preparing the program. But now actually after 2017, after this European Capital of Culture, Aarhus is over, to still continue this work. And we can also see this in Brussels that the central Denmark office is very active and still uh, thinks in a way strategically, not only about uh, the city itself, Aarhus, but also about uh, um, areas close to the city that in a way also benefited from, uh, from this experience. Um, another also very recent example linking this time to European Capital of Culture 2018 in Galway um, is the Creative Places uh, Truem in, in Ireland, which has just launched in January this year 
um, a three-year pilot project uh, led by Arts Council of Ireland. Uh, Chuam is situated only 30 kilometers from, from Galway, so in a way it's also um, kind of well-placed to, to take, take advantage of, of that. And this is a pilot project which is going to, uh, to finance the local capacity building for, for colored grassroots initiatives uh, and foster uh, creativity and arts engagement among the population. Um, of course, what's important again is that local authorities work as enablers. So it's also their role to to somehow tap into the local creativity. Uh, we have examples of, uh, of of cities, for instance, uh, including in this idea of design thinking, uh, uh, full time designer or design officers in their in their offices. So it's, it it has also happened in Helsinki. It has happened, for instance, in Saint Etienne in France, uh, where a person with a design uh, background is actually part of the. Um, part of the, the, the administration, it actually kind of infuses the local administration ways of thinking with this, uh, with, with, you know, this kind of cultural spirit too. Um, culture, uh, culture for Cities and Region project has just finished, but um, what we are doing and what we started this year is actually another uh, kind of similar peer learning activity, Culture Heritage in Action. Uh, which is uh, led by Eurocities in collaboration again with uh, Erin and Kea, but also with uh, other partners such as Europa Nostra and Architects Council of Europe. And this time, this peer learning project looks at how cultural heritage can be included in local um, uh, local practices. And what's important with this project, actually, we want to have a balance between urban and non-urban um, strategies and practices. And I'm very happy to say that last week, we actually officially launched uh, a catalog of carefully selected 32 cases from all across Europe in how um, local and regional authorities include cultural heritage in their practices. I'm also going to share it with you in the chat. Um, and last but not least, of course, uh, again, it's important to look for, for different practices. Um, there is no one size fits all solution if, in this discussion. So, you know, we can share examples. It does not mean that what works in one region or area is going to work in another, but it's very important to have this kind of discussion. So um, kind of last, let's say, document or, 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 or work I wanted to share with you. Um, is the Voices of Culture group on culture in non-urban areas, which we as the commission organized this year. Uh, the idea here was to bring to the table uh, 35 organizations from across Europe that work on these topics. And I'm happy to say that Ruritach was also among the 35 organizations selected uh, in this competitive process. And uh, um, this group came up also with a, with a report with specific recommendations for policymakers on how to include culture um, in local policies. And also also with very specific case studies that you can you can see for yourself in in this report and since it has a very specific angle focused on um, on, on non-urban areas I think this is also very relevant for for our discussions here of course you know some of these practices that I mentioned they go beyond the scope of uh, ERDF and smart specialization strategies but I think it's even more interesting and this is what other speakers mentioned too it's important to to also kind of make sure that uh, this initiatives function in this uh, combined uh, ecosystem of different financing mechanisms and of different different initiatives. So it's not only, of course, CRDF and smart specialization strategies, but being part of the broader local uh, ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, indeed, please don't forget to share the links of the examples that you mentioned in the chat. Uh, we will also be sharing the chat content with all participants so that we can keep it as a reference in the future. Um, I, I want to stress this uh, idea of uh, more and more regions actually involving designers in the process, having a chief creative officers or a design office within the region or the council. Um, we have seen the importance of interlinking uh, between silos and of designing uh, broader strategies. And we can see that actual innovation in terms of process innovation or you know, systems innovation uh, is becoming key in this uh, in this series three um, discussion. So uh, I would like to now ask Mr. Uh, Professor Fusco Girard, I, I, I hope you're still around, um, so that you can also bring us from your perspective, you also talked about uh, design, the importance of designing uh, circular models, uh, designing regenerative systems. Uh, from your perspective and your, from your experience in Italy, could you also give us some examples of uh, research and innovation process that valorize cultural natural heritage uh, from this regional uh, territorial perspective? Thank you. Yes, yes, do you hear me, do you hear me? Yes. 
Thank okay. you. Okay, in my opinion, we have here in Naples a very interesting example of uh, the capacity to transform uh, an archaeological site, a cultural site uh, in the district of Sanità into uh, an, a new system, into an engine, into a, a driver for a new development in the district uh, towards a human-centered uh, development. Uh, the condition is and was the, uh, a new entrepreneurship, a new entrepreneurial strategy, not linked to the traditional one that is linked to grants, to uh, incentives, to public support and so on. No, it was, it is an interesting good example in which uh, uh, using in a systemic way the existing resource, it is possible to change, to change, to make a real change. So uh, the change means that uh, today, uh, this example, this practice uh, can produce not only financial flows of resources, but uh, first of all, a sense of co-belonging between the place, the spatial space, the archaeological cultural space and the community. Um, this district, uh, Sanità, is a, is a periphery in the center of Naples. It was a periphery. Now it is not so. Uh, it, is, uh, it was a district uh, characterized by very high uh, in growing poverty, illegal economy, violence, uh, drugs, uh, many waste of all kinds. So uh, a new change was uh, implemented by Antonio Loffredo. Antonio Loffredo is a, is a priest, is the responsible of the church of Santa Maria La Sanità. He's it was able to propose to all the people a new vision, a vision that is it's possible to change using existing resources and investing in human capitals and in particular in young people to transform the existing resources into a systemic uh, logic. So the first step was uh, the uh, capacity to use in the, the archaeological site under the point of view of tourism and very success, with good, very, very interesting success. And this is uh, the archaeological area, uh, the engine, economic engine of all the system, of all the system. The, the, can, can we show... Um, the diagram, please. Can you show the diagram? The second slide, perhaps. Perhaps is more more clear. Yes, it is exactly exactly yes. It is exactly the implementation of the tripolar diagram, the self-organized system. Uh, this engine was able to sustain other uh, functions, public, social, cultural, uh, sanitary, health functions. Uh, and also some of them was able to come back to the system to reinforce the system itself in a um, symbiotic uh, terms. Uh, can we go to the other one, please, to the other, other slides? Mm. Thank you. Yes, uh, these, were, these are the six, the uh, five, yes, uh, five church not used. You can see the images of these uh, um, archaeological uh, and also uh, heritage capital is very interesting. It they was empty on functions. Please, can you go to the other slide? The new functions was uh, the other slide, please. Yes, the new functions was, uh, uh, for example, uh, the entrance uh, the catacombe. We, through a specific tour, the columbarium, the school, the business incubator, the uh, bed and breakfast, uh, traditional bed and breakfast, but also a recording studio, a, an orchestra, an after school activity dedicated to, in particular to the disadvantaged children, the theater, 
a very, very important activity is the theater activity or some other artistic activities into a new business incubator for developing this kind of entertainment activities, the cinema. And the museum, the concert hall, the auditorium was other functions in the Basilica di San Gennaro with the, the, the capacity to uh, enhance many, many uh, level of uh, impacts, existing impacts, but at the end, in the next one, please, the next one, the next one, the next one, the next slide, please. Yes, I would like to stress the, the attention of, into the, the capacity to reshape the territorial areas, the public space uh, around these five plus archaeological sites. Uh, this was a success, a total success. The, in my opinion, the more important aspect are cultural impacts. The feeling, the perception of the people to become a community. The perception of people that they can have a new future, a more desirable future that is possible to change and they are becoming more and more pride to live in this district. And some indicators in, in this indicate that are the reduction of the level of criminality and so on. And the, uh, the local community was reinforced uh, through this circular relationship between the public space, space heritage, and the community itself. The perception is together is possible to change, and they have already very, very changed. In my opinion, this is a very interesting experience. It is not only an experience in terms of financial, because it's very interesting, the outcomes in financial economic terms, but in particular in social and cultural impacts. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Fusca Girard. That is indeed a very inspiring example that shows not only how we can invest in uh, the adaptive reuse of uh, historical buildings in our towns and cities, but how important the actual usage is and engaging um, existing uh, communities, societies, uh, creative, uh, creative people in actual making most and not just renovating for the sake of renovation. So um, thank you uh, also for stressing the how the, the the adaptive reuse of a specific monument can really revive an entire neighborhood and many spaces around them. So we also see the spatial interconnection of separate projects that can, within a village or within a region, create um, more, let's say, than the sums um, of the different um, interventions. So um, I would now turn to uh, Mr. Um, bueno Benito. I don't think if any, uh, if the examples uh, discussed so far actually uh, connect to what you have implemented in, in, in Castilla y Leon. Um, I would like to ask uh, from your experience as a region that has worked with cultural natural heritage within the history con context, um, what, uh, what are your lessons learned from the first period, let's say, of implementations and what would be your, your recommendations for people that are entering this process right now? Okay, thank you, Stefania. Um, for, for me, the, the main lesson uh, learned is that cultural natural heritage is not a product for tourism or other things. For the, the, I think cultural natural heritage support the well-being of the people. And this well-being is, uh, is a multi-topic uh, concept that uh, has a lot of uh, implications. So, if we consider that it's important to keep, maintain, and because it affects to our life, it's, 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 it's very important and is the, the real and interesting focus. Uh, more lesson learned, for example, that cooperation with others, with uh, companies, with universities, with all entities and stakeholders in the territory is very important. Cluster, to improve the clustering, to put to where all these uh, uh, stakeholders is important. And in the regional uh, context, in the national context, and the international context, because we, we can have 
three different levels in case of Spain of uh, cooperation and uh, clustering. Uh, to, the, to keep uh, a budget, an important budget to fund the research is also, and the innovation is also important because the things not happen by, by itself. Uh, we need to improve, uh, we need to put money in the important things. Um, uh, all, the, all, all the initiatives uh, cannot be in, in the hands of the administration because uh, we cannot uh, substitute to the companies, owners, and citizens, and we, we must all, all all the mornings, the people who are in the, the the public administration must think that that we cannot uh, substitute to the others, and we our main uh, contribution could be uh, helping others to to be the the, the main characters in this in this uh, in this context. And also that technology is an instrument that is not a goal in, in the case of cultural heritage and, and natural heritage. And to keep uh, standing the social participation in good, in good uh, condition. Um, recommendation, not for the others, for me, because I, 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 I need to recommend me every day you know, to, to maintain a, a good budget, to put all together, to try to, to to put the, the universities and, and the stakeholders together, reduce bureaucracy, that is very difficult because uh, every time we try to make simple the processes, we finally produce a new, more complex process uh, to improve, improve the cooperation with other partners, the, to foster the entrepreneurship, that is the key element for the future of our rural uh, on urban areas, uh, entrepreneurs uh, connected with different fields of uh, an economic sector. Um, don't forget intangible heritage that is important for the future of our communities. Um, give the voice to social organizations. This focus that has been mentioned, the bottom up focus or process, is very important if we want to keep the people engaged. Uh, if we don't have the people engaged in our uh, project, it's impossible to have a good success. Um, and the, finally, the connection with all the common problems that we have in our society, the Green Deal, the dem demographic challenge, the global competitiveness. Uh, we are sure that uh, our sector, the cultural and natural heritage, can give uh, ideas, can give um, opportunities to collaborate with these other uh, main problems that we have in the, our society. So uh, to keep connected um, with the real life is important for the cultural heritage uh, sector. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bueno Benito. Uh, I can see from your experience, you need a lot of, uh, we all need in the, in the process of implementation, those reminders to self, because it's very easy to get carried away in the bureaucracy and forget, as you said, you know, the real, the real issues that culture can interconnect uh, at the local level. Um, going to uh, Mrs. Gabriela Macoveyu, I would like to um, ask you also, up to your experience so far, um, what uh, would be your advice for cultural actors that are interested in uh, engaging in the risk free processes? And maybe also looking at the chat, uh, if you have in mind uh, a specific project in the rural context that you would like to implement, let's say in the next uh, programming period, just to give also an additional example, maybe from the rural context. Thank you. So um, I think it is very important, first of all, to get engaged and participate because one of the big lessons that we have learned in the, the time that we designed and implemented smart specialization was the fact that 
every process needs to, to be maintained as a continuous process. And to do that, you need to have sophisticated methodologies that uh, allow to the people to come together to co-create and to create practically the necessary linkages, synapses that generate these um, innovative ideas. So my first to, to come into entrepreneurial discovery process workshops, to get in touch with the um, uh, coordinator that is launching public consultation or to participate in project development labs or whatever uh, is the invitation connected to their particular territory. The second one is that I want to stress the fact that they need to, to share, to share information about existing strategies because uh, smart specialization strategy at regional level is not going to solve everything that was not solved by the other strategies. I think that there is a big pressure now to come to this instrument, to put inside this everything that was left behind from the others. And I don't think it's, it's fair because this can create a that uh, can be later transformed into frustration and it's not good. So if we have two choices to involve in it, to create an EDP process that is based on the combination of local strategies and the uh, uh, common parts that can be then uh, absorbed into the innovation process of the smart specialization or to identify that leaders, that front runners that are capable to coagulate the micro innovation ecosystem around them and generate ideas. So leaders are very important. And thirdly, to advise people to uh, cautiously learn uh, or uh, prepare themselves with the innovation vocabulary. Because EDP is a facilitated dialogue where we sit together, industry with uh, university, with academia and the social uh, um, society. But what we have to, to recognize is what does makes your idea to the table that this is uh, something with added value generated is a that address an opportunity of a market it has a significant value for for a market. what does makes your idea an innovative idea what does it mean to to come with uh, new or significantly improved product services processes. We have to pay attention to this because this translates to the difficulty of finding a way for your idea. And this is also a, a very difficult learn as the implementation of an innovative idea sometimes is uh, crucial. Uh, the role of organization as coordinator and facilitator of uh, smart specialization process is to be people or identifying solutions for smart specialization has also uh, support in identification of the right path for uh, implementation. And said this, this because it's important and I see in Europe that connect the strategy with one single funding source and others are based on multiple funding sources. But and nevertheless, this has an important role with the commitment of coordinator to be sure that uh, these uh, innovative ideas are translated you need to come back 
to the table and discuss about the project if it's going to remain in the initial architecture or need to be designed in modules, in phases, in separate uh, tranches. But nevertheless, this is my final message. It, it's easy, but it's going to be very beautiful. You just need to, to communicate with those that are dealing with this in your region. You will find our uh, opportunities. Thank you. All right, it seems we have uh, some connection problems. So, Ms. Makoveyo, I'm sorry, but I will have to interrupt you. I think we got the essence of your input. Um, so, uh, so that everybody also keeps in mind, if you visit the Smart Specialization platform and you find your region on the platform, you can identify the specific contact details of the people in charge of uh, coordinating the process in your region. So as uh, all of our speakers have noticed, do knock on their doors because this entrepreneurial discovery process is two way. Some regions are more active in inviting and engaging stakeholders. Some other require also some bottom up pressure uh, in order to open up the dialogue. So do use the platform to understand exactly what the situation in your region is and how you can get involved. So I think right now I can, um, after this second round, let's say, of thoughts, uh, I will give the word back to my colleague, uh, Alexandru, uh, who will uh, discuss some of the additional questions that have been um, placed in the chat and beyond. Um, and we will slowly uh, proceed to our final remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefania, and indeed. and. Uh... Um, for me, the, the discussion presented by uh, Mr. Makovey went fine, so I think it depends a bit on uh, each individual connection. Um, indeed, we have a couple of extra uh, minutes, and uh, we were reflecting um, on uh, several of the questions that uh, have been posted now on the, the chat, but also, as we mentioned, the questions submitted from the registration process. And I think one of the interesting questions here that also brings uh, to what I presented really at the beginning about kind of having two professional groups uh, close to each other uh, is the following. So I will, I will quote the question we received. This discussion on vocabulary triggered a question. Very often academic or uh, vocabulary um, and presentation uses a language and vocabulary which feels deliberately lofty and off-putting. Uh, I feel this is a general, general problem between information silos. And the question is how to overcome this basic problem. And I think um, we can leave it open to uh, which, over, uh, which one of the speakers would like to start. Uh, and if not, we can, um, yeah. So I will repeat the question, how to overcome this basic problem about vocabulary between silos? Or maybe we can ask speakers if they have felt lost in translation or if they have uh, some ideas on how to overcome I, this I communication see, gap. I see Mr. Rinaldi, um, please take the floor. Try to break the ice. Uh, indeed, there is a, there is a uh, terminology uh, problem. I make you an example. Uh, I mean, we all know in, in, in the EU what, what we mean when we talk about regions. What is a region? Uh, if you go to the UN, a region is a world region and it's completely different. So the EU is actually a world region. Uh, so this is, and this, uh, uh, and this makes uh, misunderstandings happen. I mean, uh, this is just a, a characterization, but, uh, but still uh, we have many of those. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think that the, the main issue there is to open up channels for communication uh, across communities, uh, across uh, uh, not only, um, I would say, government uh, uh, businesses, uh, um, uh, research organizations, uh, uh, civil society in one specific territory, but also cross-disciplinary um, 
communication, both in, inside the scientific community, inside the policy making community, uh, but also in, uh, in, in, in actually in, in cities and regions and in, and in, uh, and in rural areas uh, uh, as well. Uh, I think that one successful example, and I, I, I quote it because I, I, I got the, the chance to, to actually uh, took part to some of these uh, uh, these interaction uh, was uh, has been uh, carried out in in Lapland in the north of Finland, uh, where a, a region facing specific uh, uh, challenges uh, in terms of uh, geographical uh, and and uh, population uh, I would say uh, distribution uh, has managed also to use technologies and. Uh, uh, and other specific uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, tool uh, to use a specific toolbox in order to make uh, communities talk to talk to each other and come out with a very nice, in my view, in my personal view, smart specialization uh, uh, strategy, which includes also natural and cultural heritage, by the way. So this is probably not an answer, but uh, uh, kind of a very humble suggestion on, on how we could try to face the issue. Very interesting link in terms of uh, vocabulary and also in terms of connection with other rural uh, parts. Uh, maybe I will also invite one of the representative of the regions to, to reflect because you are really at the point where everything co connects. Um, so, uh, Ms. Mark if I can, uh, one please, no, please. Yeah. big, uh, big crash uh, comes uh, when, uh, of course, uh, you have to to put in the perspective uh, the offer and there is the request of innovation, and we have seen this uh, um, also uh, as uh, from the world of academia and research toward and the way that they are doing. But I think it is also valuable for the network of people involved in the cultural um, area because they also have their own codification and language. And I think it is, um, it is useful to build this uh, level of trust between the stakeholders before you launch into other <laughs> type of uh, discussion and initiatives coming together in several initiatives uh, that are somehow preparatory uh, are very welcome. And I will give an example that we have invested a lot in our region to build the ecosystem of stakeholders. We have developed a platform of dialogue for the people involved in the, in the cultural heritage and natural heritage to come together to meet uh, frequently to share to each other the news and what they are doing. Discover Northeast is called this portal and behind it, it is all this community of people that has the, the same interest to promote uh, projects uh, in the area. I think it is an example uh, to, to, be, to, to be considered some preparatory actions to, to get ready to, to have the dinner at the same table. Yep. You need to, to build this level of uh, trust and understanding. I fully agree with you. And without trust, uh, uh, nothing can, can happen, not even this meeting. Um, and uh, I agree, that's a, a very key point. And indeed, also the culture world has its own terminology that we need to help and um, uh, make explain to others. And also this event is basically trying to do this, so to make the understanding of this concept a bit easier to bring the network and so on. Um, if somebody else wants to shortly intervene to this question, then we can still take a short answer. Yes, please, uh, Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to to add. I think that you know this discussion is is somehow broader because it of course also concerns the the whole of the the European Union vocabulary and communication, which sometimes does not necessarily work the way it should work and does not necessarily reach the citizens in the way it should reach. At the same time, I think what's important to know is that there are certain interfaces that can be used, and I think you know there is also a very crucial role of for instance, offices of regions and cities that are based in Brussels 
Mm, they are actually public civil servants whose role is in a way to also translate what's happening uh, in this EU context to their citizens. And it's, of course, their role also to translate, you know, if there are specific opportunities for cultural stakeholders to, to do this. Uh, for instance, here also to give an example, I hope quite a few of, of you know, but maybe not all of you know this, but, but you know, at, at the moment, the European Union and the Commission is also reflecting on this long-term vision for rural areas. And there is an ongoing public consultation that happens and it's open until uh, the 30th of uh, November. This is one of these things, you know, you have actually an interface to, to kind of intervene, to give your input. The issue is often that, you know, that, that information about it does not reach to the, um, to the grassroots level actually, and to the people that are probably the best fitted to, to give this kind of answer. So I guess this is also the, the interface question, but, but I'm sure at the same time that, you know, project such as your Ruritage or networks such as ECLA can also play a very important role somehow, since you are also somehow in between, I would say, these two different worlds and, uh, and perspectives. Thank you very much for that. Um, I must say, at least for me, there was a couple of seconds of interruption. So if you have something on link, you can still have time to, to post it in the chat. The connection depends uh, for each people um, uh, on, the, on the chat. With that said, I will um, stop here with this question. Of course, we have a bit more questions, but I think uh, the uh, most of them had been answered from what we received and I will give um, the next uh, uh, five minutes to uh, our colleague Simona Tondelli. She wants also to, to bring some elements uh, on this. Thank you, Alex. I will just start from this last point because I think that the key point is uh, really uh, what uh, Gabriela Macovieu was saying in her uh, presentation about the need to have a continuous process. So the language barrier to be addressed is, uh, of course, one of the first step of this continuous process. We have to start knowing each other and uh, build a common glossary, and then we can go on with our challenges. I also would like to go to address uh, a bit a sense of uh, um, challenge that is going on, on on the chat. So there is a sort of uh, a feeling like uh, it is much more difficult to work in rural areas than in urban areas from some of the questions that we have here in the chat. And in some cases, it can be true because uh, of the dimension, because of uh, some difficulty in uh, accessibility, for example. Uh, but I also think that there are a lot of opportunities in rural areas. So for example, addressing the uh, topic of social innovation and difficulties given by the diversity of people living in rural areas. In Ruritage, we really have seen how this diversity uh, can be turned into a great opportunity of integrating cultural values in building new values and in building new uh, economic and social opportunities for the um, community. Uh, and we have addressed this under our uh, systemic innovation migration. So you can find examples of this. Another topic that was addressed uh, always uh, about this uh, uh, difficult position of uh, rural areas uh, is about the built environment. That it is one of the components, of course, of heritage. So there are a few comments about uh, difficulty of addressing built environment in rural areas. And some cases it could be because uh, uh, of lack of funding, for example. But there are, again, also many opportunities in rural areas that we have uh, seen raising uh, there are a lot of empty spaces, for example, and the, the cost of those spaces is uh, often lower than in uh, urban areas. So also for people to go to live there, but also for companies to establish their own uh, um, enterprise can be an opportunity because we have this possibility to reuse a very rich uh, heritage scattered, of course, and not, we do not have uh, perhaps uh, so, such many big uh, monuments as in important cities, but we have many different opportunities. Uh, so many small venues, and I think that the examples about Naples, it is true, it was a city, but uh, uh, what we can keep from that example is uh, also um, work on diversity again. So the mix of activities uh, that can be really a, a key uh, point uh, to start from, like we did in our rural heritage hub. So they are the place where we develop uh, um, this engagement of the local community, but uh, uh, the, the people can also perform a lot of different activities there. So training courses, gym courses, 
um, food uh, preparation courses and, and so on. Um, another opportunity uh, or, uh, or need of rural areas is about the need of build um, systems of innovation. So what we have learned, and I think this very well fits with the process of smart specialization strategy, is the need to work together, to build uh, networks. So uh, uh, we, we cannot go on alone. Uh, and this is true if we think about the stakeholders at local level, but also if we think uh, to build the networks with the near city, the near town, the near country again. So uh, I think that clustering was again one of the other very important uh, uh, keywords that uh, was uh, mentioned before. Um, and also money is important, of course, we, we are here also because these uh, strategies then drive uh, funding in different directions. And I think that it is important to mention that uh, there is uh, the possibility to combine uh, different sources of funding. So uh, really to try to, to build among different sources uh, uh, towards a common goal. So to set a vision and then to, to, to find the different sources to go towards this uh, vision. And in this sense, as a rural heritage project, we, we feel that there is a, a need to work a bit on the agri agricultural policy because it could be really uh, one of the points where we make the difference in rural area, because uh, now it is very much focused on agriculture, on farmers, but it could be more open in, in including heritage, cultural, natural heritage. So this could be also a point we will work on. Um, and the final uh, um, comment is about the need to involve SMEs. Uh, one of the last comments that was here, of course, uh, we, we, we agree with this. They were not among the speakers today, but they are one of our key target groups. Uh, and uh, again, starting from this process, from the bottom-up process, uh, SMEs have a great uh, role and uh, um, have to be involved in this continuous process. Um, I will stop here just asking everyone to get in touch with their own region and ask them to get involved with us uh, to continue to discuss this uh, uh, topic. And I leave the floor to Alex to complete this information about the future next steps. Yeah, I think uh, that will be Stefania now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, great. So as we're reaching, sorry, we're just a couple of minutes over uh, noon. Uh, before closing, um, I want to just uh, quickly show the progress of our graphic recording. You will all receive it uh, together with a summary of, of today's discussion in the next days. Uh, so keep an eye on your inbox for uh, this uh, post-event material on our site. Uh, also, we're planning to publish the video of this event on the Ruritage website. So this is an additional uh, resource you can keep uh, to review or to share in the future. Um, I think that's it. I would like to warmly thank all of our speakers for their precious contributions and above all the participants. I mean, the numbers have been really exceeding our expectations. So we are delighted to set this, uh, this topic on the table, on this uh, breakfast table. Now it's almost lunchtime, but at least uh, we had a good start of the day with lots of food for thought. Alex, back to you to tell us what's next. Uh, yes, indeed. So I very quickly share uh, my screen um, to put the last uh, point. So it, it was a very fruitful discussion. I will not get a get in the in the content, just a bit of the future. So um, we hope that with the initiative today, we managed to make a small step on bringing these things together. We also talk about vocabulary and groups. And of course, we talk about continuity. So we invite you to continue this uh, with all the actors that are um, present and uh, related with the topic. Uh, we also seen that the innovation is much broader. And I relate with this part here, uh, innovation equals does not equal technology because it's a quote that Professor um, um, Dominique Fauré had in one of the webinars uh, organized by the platform, uh, is free platform a couple of weeks ago. And I think it really goes to the core of it. There will be new webinars from the platform. Go there and have a look. They are very interesting and more in the detail. 
coming back to our conundrum, I hope we managed to make a bit of positive transition here. Um, it's a complex process, but let's start it. So let's have the courage of it. And in terms of really practical next step from the Ruritage and Eclay side, next spring, we intend to open a call for expression of interest for regions with which we will be build a board of regions inside the Ruritage project. Um, in around one year from now, we will organize a workshop with these regions um, during which we will try to uh, present, let's say, a kind of a draft policy recommendation paper on which we discuss with them and reflect a bit more. And then we will uh, some, uh, publish it in full version and details after that, um, maybe spring, maybe a bit earlier. Um, and with that said, please keep in contact with us. You will find it on all the social media and the website uh, parts. Uh, we are happy to extend this uh, discussion with all the actors, depending on which sphere you go. And with that said, I just want to say a very big thank you to all of you. I'm so enthusiastic uh, from the inputs we had today. Thank you for taking the time to listen or to give your content. Um, and let's continue this uh, 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 road together. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you very much also. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure.